everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me, uh, giving me the chance to be there with you. Uh, I'm Stéphane Bouchard. I am professor at the University of Quebec in Outaouais in Gatineau. Um, just to make sure that people are aware that we are being recorded. Uh, and I'm just going to slide this on the side so I can see the group. Um, Yes, uh, I do own the Canada Research Chair. I saw my picture, reminded me of the time where I still had hairs. Um, so it's been a while. Um, and uh, I have a whole different position at the university with other affiliations. And I just want to declare a conflict of interest uh, is that I am also the president of a company called Invirtual. We might talk about it later in the discussion, uh, but now the virtual reality environments we develop in the lab once they're done, the University of Quebec in Utawe uh, developed this, um, this company with us uh, where we create this company where we actually could distribute the virtual environments commercially. Uh, the profits goes back to the university, but still um, just to make sure that that had been said uh, early in the talk. Um, so just to say that there's a long list of tradition of research using virtual reality. I'm not going to address uh, examples about the military, the medical training, because that has been used for decades. Uh, but this is one of the early studies we did on fear of flying, uh, early 2000. We actually started, I actually started doing research in VR in 1999. So it's been a while now. Uh, there's different technologies. You might have heard about CAVE, uh, C-A-V-E, which are, which are big immersive room uh, we have one in a lab. You see here one or a research participant in the cave. It's a big wall. It's a big cube where images are projected from the back walls. Uh, and in ours, there's coming from all directions. Uh, so all sides in the top and the floor. And um, people can navigate in it and actually see themselves in these virtual environments. Uh, you can also see some other more common technologies. Now, yeah, we're not getting mention any specific brands, but uh, now you can purchase virtual reality equipment uh, at Canadian Tires, uh, just to name a Canadian brand. Uh, so if it's available there, it's available everywhere. So it's not science fiction anymore. Uh, and I'm not going to talk much about augmented reality, uh, which is a technology we're also working on uh, in the lab. And in augmented reality, you put the goggles on, you see the reality, which I would see my office, Plus, on top of it, you augment what I see by virtual stimuli. So that's an example here of myself looking at a research assistant where there's actually a virtual character on a table dancing. So you can overlay virtual images on top of um, standard images. For those of you who would have questions, uh, I suggest we keep the questions for the end. I won't be able to take them in the chat while I'm talking. Uh, and there is a copy of uh, the PowerPoint presentation that was sent in PDF uh, to the organizing committee. So it's possible. I'm glad if you want to have a copy uh, to share copies with everyone. So let's define virtual reality uh, just to make sure we start at least on the same page. Um, there's different definitions of VR. Uh, the one I like come from Philip Fish uh, in France. And the reason I like this one uh, it's because it's not based on one technology. Lots people, a lot of people say, well, you need goggles where you don't, well, you don't need goggles to do VR. I showed, for example, the cave system we have in the lab. Uh, some other people say, yeah, you need vision. Well, you don't need vision to do VR. They're virtual reality system for blind people. Essentially, it's based on 3D or specialized sound. So you have to shy away from a specific technology and find something that broadly defined VR and makes it different far from other things uh, and the study the definition the definition I like is that VR is essentially the use of computer and behavioral interfaces to simulate the behavior of 3D entities the objects tables virtual character what have you and interact in real time one of the key points is the interaction we'll come to that in a second but interact in real time with each other so with the user and their virtual 3D objects and being immersed in via sensory or being immersed via sensory um, sensory motor channels. Being immersed is, think you, imagine you take your cell phone and you immerse it in water. Don't do that, obviously, but when it's submersed, 
it's when it's surrounded by the water, by the stimuli. So I think it is important to make the, dis the, 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 the distinction here between immersion and other concepts such as presence that we're going to talk in a minute. Immersion is when you put your hands in water, you feel it's humid, you feel cold or warmth or the characteristic of the water, but the fact that you're surrounded by these stimuli, this is immersion, You have your hand being projected. What you feel, what you experience is not immersion. What you experience is what you experience. Um, and we'll come to emotions and so on in a minute. Why am I saying this? Uh, because virtual reality system could be more immersive than others. For example, here you have a, a patient in our lab where, where wearing a head mount display. When when you wear, wear the goggles, it's more immersive, uh, or it is immer it's more immersive than a desk, a computer desk. You'll maybe listening at me. Uh, ooh, did I lose? Uh, did I stop share? Yeah. It stopped sharing automatically. Sorry about that. Uh, back to this. Okay. Um, so, you, people are probably having lunch right now, eating their sandwiches or soup, whatever. So you see your 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 the surrounding field of view. You see the computer. So you're not that immersed in the discussion we have today. You might be immersed with the head the headphones you're wearing. But if we put goggles on and you can't see the surroundings, you only see what's in the goggle, well, then you're more immersed. You're more surrounded by stimuli. If I add music and sound, well, you're more immersed. If, if I then add taste or uh, tactile feedback, you're even more immersed. So immersion is the propriety of the system and uh, the, the, the stimuli that you're surrounded with. And the key point in VR is the interaction in real time. Um, some movie theaters, for example, are really immersive. If you think about IMAX theater, you see big screens. This is very immersive, but you can't interact. In an IMAX, an IMAX movie, if someone gets close to a cliff and then the people who shot the film decided that at, I don't know, 10 minutes and 35 seconds, you're gonna go on the cliff and then jump over the cliff. It's a movie, you can't control what's going on. So it's very immersive because you have a really large field of view, but as a user, as a person in a, in a movie theater, you can't do anything uh, because, well, you can move, but it doesn't act, change the action going on on the screen. In virtual reality, if you're afraid of height, you can actually turn back and actually get out of the screen as I'm getting out of the camera now. Um, so by interacting with the virtual stimuli, it creates the illusion that you are really into these virtual environments. A bit more uh, definition and context again, the notion of presence. Uh, I need to highlight again the difference between immersion, you feel surrounded by the stimuli when you, like you, when you immerse your hand in water, and presence. Presence is the illusion of being there in the virtual environments. And one really interesting article to read is from Mel Slater from the UK, where presence is essentially an illusion. It's the illusion that you are in that virtual place and the stimuli are plausible. So you're on the beach. Uh, we're not upper Canada. We're not really close to summer yet if you see outside. So I could my, put my goggles on and then I would be on a virtual beach and if someone throws me a ball, I would probably move away either to grasp the ball or to avoid the ball. And so I'm interacting. The stimuli are plausible because someone's throws, is th throwing me a ball and I would want to either grab it or avoid it. So it's plausible. The brain process the stimuli as if they're true. And there's the illusion of a place. I'm not in Gatineau anymore. I'm on that beach. So I have the impression that I'm brought on that place, which is away from my office. And if you want to know more about uh, presence, uh, I suggest a paper we published uh, last year uh, and to essentially say that presence, as I'm just saying, is just a good damn illusion or no, a damn good illusion, sorry. It's a damn good illusion and it's a damn good illusion because it's based on sensory integration and multi-sensory integration. It goes back to the notion of interaction. When I'm moving my head around, my eyes would see movement in the virtual environment because I see images changing. But my inner ear is also picking up head rotation 
And if the head rotation fits with what my eye sees, we now have two senses saying the same thing, that it's really moving around. Plus, there's a proprioception. My body, my torso, and my skin is conveying the message to my brain that I'm rotating my head. So if all this information are congruent and they make sense, for the brain, it's plausible that is real. Uh, you've heard probably of lots of visual and optical illusion. I uh, invite you after uh, the lunch today or later in the evening uh, to look at the Pinocchio illusion. Uh, it's something it's really nice to do. If you would, if you would be together in a room, uh, I would gather people and we would do it. Uh, but look at videos on the Pinocchio illusion uh, on um, on YouTube. You'll find it really funny. It's you close your eyes, you extend your arm, and you touch. You have your arm extended, and while your arm is extended, someone touches your nose your nose while your finger is touching someone else's nose in front of you. You'd have to see it, but we only have um, 90 minutes, uh, 15 minutes to do the, the talk. But it gives you the impression if your eyes are closed and it's really well timed uh, or synchronous, you have the impression that your nose is actually longer, like Pinocchio. Uh, and as soon as you open your eyes, it kills the illusion. Or as, so, as soon as the tempo or the timing is not perfect and it's not synchronized, you'll, you lose the illusion. Uh, but as an example of multi-sensory integration where the sense of touch, proprioception, and from the finger and from the nose, they're all co coherent and converging to the fact that my nose has to be that long. If I sense a feeling here that is coherent with the touch of the nose. Um, so some background just to provide information about why will virtuality work? And we'll probably address that in the end, is why VR works? Well, because of this multi-sensory illusion. So that's a bit introduction on VR. The rest of the talk is where are we at and what are the next step in mental health, uh, which is my specific field of interest. So we're gonna focus on mental health. And because we're gonna focus on mental health, I need to provide some information about the treatment of mental disorders, just because I, make, I need to make sure you don't think I'm crazy, uh, because when you see what, gonna, what we're doing with patients, I think we need some background. So let's begin with anxiety disorders. Anxiety disorders, what do we know about VR and anxiety disorders? Well, first, if you want to understand anxiety disorders, I need to provide basic information. And the basic information is, let's say I'm afraid of spiders. So let's say I'm afraid of spiders. Um, so we'll take a spider here. Why a spider phobic would be afraid of spider? What's going on through their brain? Well, if a spider phobic sees a spider, what happens in the brain is there's association with threat. If if you're afraid of spiders because you think it's threatening or disgusting, but it's some kind of a form of a threat anyway. So there's a perception of threat. When we perceive something as threatening, as threatening, it leads to emotion, anxiety, and fear, and that relates to a part of the brain that deal with emotion. The limbic system, the amygdala in the middle here, is the part of the brain that deals with emotions. And within about 12 milliseconds, when I show a spider to a phobic, it triggers the amygdala response. Immediately within 12 milliseconds, I get the <gasps> fear response. And then the, the brain process the rest of the information. If I'm afraid of spiders and you show me a spider's I won't like it. And because I don't like it, logically, I would move away from it. So if it would be a TV show, I would switch channel. If it's a spider on my land, I will move away. So logically, when you see something as threatening and it raises these emotions, people would tend to avoid because I don't like it. And if I avoid facing what I'm afraid of, which makes a lot of sense, well, the brain, the limbic system, the part of the brain that deals with emotion doesn't have the chance to learn that spiders are not dangerous. That's just a little tiny spider walking on your land or your lawn, for example. Same thing with public speaking. We mentioned I've heard about uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Well, the same thing, all of these disorders or these anxiety-related disorders, there's something associated with threat, 
involves the limbic system and because it's threatening it makes a lot of sense not to face it because it is threatening but the trap here is that by avoiding it maintains the fear response Sim simple we can make it very more complicated very much complicated we will keep it simple why am i addressing that because when we go to treatment when we address the treatment for anxiety disorders, and we'll address other disorders, we'll talk about uh, addictions, we'll talk about uh, eating disorders, we'll talk about schizophrenia uh, within the talk today. But when we look at evidence-based treatment, was what works and what works the best uh, for people who have an anxiety disorder, there is pharmacotherapy, that's a really good effective option, we won't go into that, and there is psychotherapy, it is another very effective option and within the psychotherapies there's what we call cognitive behavior therapy or cbt what do we do what's in the tool the treatment tool of of cbt therapist well we take the time to know the person to really understand what is going on for that person build a strong alliance so on but but for anxiety disorders the key ingredient is the one in bold here is what we call the exposure in all effective treatment for anxiety disorders, you will find some form of exposure, some form or, or, or another of facing your fear. That's the key, that has been known to be the key since at least the 1980s, well, well demonstrated in 1990s, so well known from the, 19, the year 2000 and so on, that it's now assumed that is the key treatment, the key ingredient in the treatment. And coming back to my model, what is exposure? You see here myself with a spider, a real life spider, live tarantula. Essentially, because I said earlier, if you avoid, you maintain what's encoded in the brain as a threat uh, equation. Well, then if you prevent people from avoiding slowly, progressively with all the therapeutic context, but if you help people to face what they're afraid of, the limbic system, the amygdala, will learn that it is safe. The art of the thing is to do it adequately, slowly enough, but well paced and support the patient. This is for another hour um, of talk, of course. But essentially, the exposure is people, we put people in situations where the limbic system can learn that it is safe. It means facing your fear. So it means that this plastic spider is interesting to beginning, begin the therapy, but after a while, we may need to have a spider in a jar and then play with the spider in a jar and then open the jar and so on. So we're not to VR yet, but that is essential to understand that we're not sadistic therapists that want people to freak out. We are psychotherapists that help patients progressively at their own pace face what they're afraid of so they can succeed and really emotionally learn by experience that it is safe. Easy to do with spiders because you can go outside, grab a spider. Fear of flying, it's quite a challenge because for fear of flying, I would have to fly with my patient. And if I fly with my, first I'm not a pilot. Um, if, I fly with, if I fly with my patient, uh, it's gonna be cost to the flying ticket them and mine. We need to do it quite a few times, so it's going to cost already an arm and a leg. Plus, I can't control as a passenger what's going on in the flight. Even as a, as a pilot, you can't avoid turbulences. So you don't have the control on what will go on in therapy, so you can help the patient progressively face their fear of flying. So we stay on the ground and we don't leave we don't leave for two hours because you're not ready. Once you're ready and only then we, we take off and we land only when you're ready, which is things we can't do in, in real life. So you have myself here in psychotherapy with a woman. The woman is wearing the virtual reality goggle, the head mount display, and what she sees on the other side, what she sees is actually an airplane. So she feels that she is in, in an airplane. She feels present as being in the airplane but she's in the safety of my office and we're talking together and I'm not wearing the goggles, but I see on my computer what she's seeing through her goggles. And then we can take off only when it's time or we can land 25 times within an hour and only land or have only turbulences or whatever that she needs to go through in psychotherapy to expose herself 
And so the limbic system, the amygdala can learn that it is safe. Does it work? To make a long story short, does it work? Yes. Uh, I'm taking a few examples here. This is a meta-analysis that was done a few years ago, uh, and they use behavioral assessment. What is a BL assessment? It's not a questionnaire. It's not a question questionnaire. People can say whatever they want on questionnaire, but they might say, oh, okay, I'm capable of doing something, and they're not that much capable, capable, capable of. So behavioral assessment is exactly what you have here. I have a tarantula in the lab. The tarantula is in the vivarium, and I invite you to open the vivarium, kind of grab, grab a pen and actually poke the tarantula and have it walk around and probably invite you, if you want, to have the tarantula in your hand and hold it or have it on the table, let it crawl and crawl on your legs, for example. So behavioral assessment is, can they do it? Fear of flying, the study by, um, that's for spiders, but the study uh, by um, Barbara Rothbaum for fear of flying, they offered plane ticket to phobics. If they agreed to take the plane ticket, Pre-treatment, they're not severe enough. And post-treatment, we look at how many patients are actually taking a flight. Um, so you got, what you have here is a, there's questionnaires, of course, but objective measures of improvement. And we see on the meta-analysis here that is we're, we're significantly away from zero, meaning that, yes, there's really large effect size and it works, it works effectively, on questionnaire, we'll come to that in a minute, but definitely even on behavioral assessments, where, for example, people have people who are afraid of height have to walk to a fryer escape. Uh, people who are afraid of spiders, for example, have to approach spiders, as I mentioned. Um, if we compare now psychotherapy, CBT, that has via virtual reality in it, VR-based exposure, uh, does it work? If we look at all the randomized controlled trial published by 2018, um, and we compare that to waiting list, you see that yes, it works and it favors the treatment. So these studies were randomized controlled trial, highly well done, really recommended studies, and it is more effective than a waiting list. Waiting lists are cool, but what is it with active treatment? Now, if we look at virtual reality, exposure-based treatment compared to controls where you have active treatment, not just passive waiting, but actually providing standard of care. And we see that globally, essentially, virtual reality is no less effective than standard treatment, oh, and it's no more effective than standard treatment. We'll come to that. Uh, why is it no more effective? And that is one of the take out, take a take a take home message after the talk today. But essentially, we have that we are able to show that VR, even though it's virtual, is as effective as standard treatment. Why would it work? because somehow it's a bit crazy. Uh, people are not facing real spiders. They're not taking a real airplane. They're not talking in front of real people for social anxiety. And we have an example of a study here where in a nutshell, it works for two reasons, the two, the two little red star here. It works because when we do exposure in virtual reality, people build their self-efficacy. People build their self-efficacy. This is a kid touching the virtual spider, the virtual plastic spider, learning to phase a spider in virtual reality. And it works because people develop their confidence in facing spiders, self-efficacy. Also, it changes their beliefs about spiders. They stop thinking that spiders are threatening. So the limbic system, the amygdala, is learning through experience, although it's virtual, it is learning through experience that this, these stimuli are real and I can acquire my self efficacy and change my belief. And it does translate to objective real stimuli. So, and it's this whole notion of presence that you could actually fool the brain to feel and think that it is real, although it's not. And this is because of the multi-sensory integration I mentioned before. So for anxiety disorders, what are the next key research question? You have a list here, we'll see some of them, and I'll come back with the same set of slides for addiction and then for eating disorder and then for schizophrenia, and then I'm gonna wrap up and uh, we'll have about 10 minutes for question and answers. So uh, first document the efficacy for complex anxiety disorders with active control condition. I mentioned so far studies with phobias. The problem with phobias is 
it's it's a stand, it's easy to treat. It's not that easy, but people are just afraid of spiders. Uh, think about more complex anxiety disorder, like social anxiety, where people are afraid of the judgment of others when they do social interactions. Think about obsessive compulsive disorder. Think about post-traumatic stress disorder. It's obviously way more complex to treat. So is it effective? We know for social anxiety disorder 2018, there was a randomized, there was a, uh, a meta-analysis that looks at all good randomized control trials, those in the bottom here, where we compared um, through randomized control trial, through RCTs, if we compare virtual reality to waiting list, but more importantly, the group in the bottom to other active treatment. And we show that essentially it is effective for social anxiety disorder. It's more effective than the waiting list. It's more effective than the placebo, and it is as effective as the standard treatment. But we have this information only for social anxiety disorder. We're still looking for such strong evidences for PTSD, for OCD, uh, for generalized anxiety disorder, etc. So there's room for research there. We know it works for phobias because the treatment is more circumscribed, and we we do less complicated things when we treat uh, when we do psychotherapy for phobias than more complex anxiety disorders. These are the kind of randomized control trial actually being done right now around the world. Um, what are the advantages in terms of cost effectiveness? I said before, it is more effective than no treatment, more effective than placebo, but not more effective than standard treatment. So why the hell do VR? Well, first, if you look at my question is cost effectiveness, and then we'll look at treatment outcome. But in terms of cost effectiveness, there's one study so far that looked at the cost effectiveness. Because for, for spiders, I need to have a spider in a lab. Some psychotherapists don't like to have a spider. If it's, if it's a tarantula, I need to have a tarantula in my lab. Well, if, I treat, treat it, if I'm treating people who fear snakes, I need snakes in my lab. If I treat people who are afraid of cows, I need a cow in my lab. So you see now at some point it becomes complicated. Uh, if you're flying, there's cost issues because we we need to fly. For social anxiety, it means that I have to go to places with my patients. It needs that they need to, uh, I don't know, wear a crazy little now a clown nose, a clown nose to face what people could think of them. So if we amount the total amount of cost in that measure, what that that uh, is a special that measures the amount of work that people do when they do exposure in psychotherapy, and you see that globally, the amount of work required to do in vivo exposure, doing the real thing, and the amount of work required to do virtual reality is significantly less. Means that it may not be more effective, we'll come to that in a minute, but it's definitely more cost effective because you're saving on the cost and the cumbersomeness of going to those places, of having to feed the tarantula once in a week, having to feed the cow in your office because next cow phobic is coming in a month. That's a joke, but clearly it's more cost effective. But could it be more effective? Well, I think that as a researcher that has been doing research for more than 20 years in virtual reality, we did lack imagination. We thought it was pretty cool to use VR. We thought, oh, that's the next hot thing is to use the technology. And we were all proud of this really imaginative and innovative and cool idea. But if you think of it, if facing a real spider works, why virtual reality would be more effective? It could be as effective, but why would it be more effective? What are the advantages? What can we not do in vivo that we could do in VR? And that's the next question is, can we improve exposure? And that's an example of a study that was presented briefly uh, and we're working on the paper for the, the full um, publication. So you're getting a, a scoop now, it's fear of height. And on fear of height, we're wondering, does it work if we invite people who are afraid of height, seriously afraid of height, clinically afraid of heights, does it work if they invite them to actually jump in a cliff? Because if I go back to the amygdala, people who are afraid of height are afraid to being drawn in the cliff and to fall if they don't want to fall. 
So what we did in that study is we have this high platform in VR and they would come on the platform and we randomized the participants in two groups. Half the participants would do exposure, a few sessions of exposure by going in VR and looking down at the cliff. The other group wouldn't be invited whenever they're ready, only when they're ready to actually jump on the cliff. So what happens is they don't want to jump because they're afraid of height. So we support them and then we they are there to try. So they could probably dance around and then, you know, walk and close their eyes and then actually jump. What is fascinating is these patients, those who jumped, realize that they're not drawn by the cliff. They jump or they fall only when they want. And we have an objective measure of that. I mentioned the behavioral assessment earlier. Well, this is a firefighter um, ladder. Uh, it's actually in a gym place, but it's a firefighter. And then they have to actually step on how many steps of the ladder they could go up. So we're talking about phobics of heights. And what you see on this behavioral awareness test is if we do exposure pre-post, there's a significant improvement for those who are just standing on the platform, looking down and facing their fear. But there's significantly more improvement in those who actually jump, where they do things that are so crazy they could not dare do in vivo because they're going to die. But they could learn it in virtual reality and get back of out or get out of the experience and go back home knowing that they will never fall off a cliff if they don't actually want to fall uh, or are willing to fall. Uh, so it works and now we're pushing actually the envelope. So now we're moving to the next step of making standard treatment more effective with VR because we're applying the old knowledge of helping the limbic system learning, but with a daring ideas, for example, in social anxiety, they would stand up in a virtual restaurant and sing the Traviata or whatever. And if they sing, if they're good singers, we'd ask them to actually sing and actually make mistakes while they're singing or confound music or do something stupid because we want people to do things where they can really build a self-efficacy that I can cope with that, even in such a train strange situation. There's also the idea of automated treatment where fear of height here is studied done by Jonathan Freeman in UK, where there's this virtual character in the virtual environment that is coming and talking to you and helping you as a patient pace your exposure, but without the presence of the therapist. It's a virtual therapist. We could come, come to that on that, uh, to, to this study if you have questions in the end, because it's not going to replace psychotherapists, at least not for a good 20 years. Well, 10 years. But we'll come to that if, if people are interested in that little part of the story. Other research questions for anxiety disorders. Well, how can we make virtual environment more personalized? That's the question that everyone was wondering. Could it make it personalized? But again, is it worth, is it necessary? And is it worth the disadvantages? Because if you want to make virtual environment more personalized and say in the fear of height here, you want to re replace the platform by something that looks like uh, a building you have in Waterloo or a building someone has in Boston. Well, you need to recreate the virtual environment. That cannot be done in a fly. That'll take some amount of money, some work, some time. And then people say, you know, it's not exactly the right color. And the railing is not exactly at the same height. And we get into really, really complicated discussions about details. Is it worth it? We don't know yet. Um, we also have to remind, to, to recall and remind people that it must remain user friendly for the users and doesn't matter which kind of application you develop engineer like to develop really cool well done applications that are really complicated and they could control everything and do things great because this is their creativity um, at, uh, at work i'm working with psychologists honestly psychologists the example i would say is they could put they could post pictures on facebook but they can hardly remove a picture from Facebook. That's the kind of techy, how techy psychologists are. It's a stereotype, but ask psychologists around, you'll see what I mean. Uh, back in the days, I was saying that they can use a VCR, but I'm not sure they could play a plug a VCR. 
the yellow, white, right, and red uh, cables. Uh, that was a challenge. So psychologists, we're not high tech. We're not high tech people. So if you have in virtual environments with lots of buttons and things to click, it's a nightmare for end users, which are psychologists. Uh, there's also the idea of using 360 degree camera. Uh, you can take a, a picture now and it creates an image of the uh, the highest place at uh, Waterloo and you can use it in VR. Really good idea, really cool, not very expensive. Remember, however, that in 360 de degrees, videos or pictures, you can't get out of the frame. You can't get out of the picture because in VR, if I want to interact and I decided to leave and I would leave the camera and get out of the screen, I could do that because the environment, the computer is recreating the environment in real time. In a picture, if the picture was taken from here, I can't go behind the camera because there was no one behind the camera to take the picture. I can't walk five miles or five kilometers on the right or the left because I'm going to get out of frame. So cheaper, but comes with disadvantages. And uh, what are the relationship between presence and outcome? That's another really hot topic in Creaser's question. Do we need more presence? My own personal pick is that uh, the relationship between presence and at least anxiety and treatment outcome is not linear. What we realize is when people don't feel anxious at all in, in virtual reality, they don't get present. And when they don't feel presence at all, they're not anxious. But at the, at a, after a while, if you increase anxiety, they, somehow they really get present. So you see this is not a linear relationship. There's a hoop here, there's a step, and then it kind of plateaued. And so if I add smell, and I had the feeling of touch, and I had the feeling of taste, and all of these things are not provide, are not gonna provide a lot more anxiety. They're not gonna provide a significantly more presence, but it make the experience more realistic. So we don't know exactly yet what is the relationship between all those things. Addictions. Well, to in a nutshell, uh, to present things differently, there's a nice little co complicated model here, but if I go directly to treatment, if I had to treat someone who's addicted to cocaine, for example, they're sitting in my office, they're calm, relaxed, and I could ask them, "Are you? do you think you can control yourself? They're probably going to say, yes, Stefan, I can control myself. I'm in total control. If there's cocaine, there's no trouble. So the, the real game, the real thing will happen when they leave my office, they go back home, they meet a friend, the regular pusher that offers them cocaine, and now they have to practice what they'll learn in therapy. It would be much more efficient in psychotherapy if I could actually offer cocaine to my patients. I could have a little line here, I could draw a little line and offer the patient and say, just a little sniff. I won't tell anyone, can you, can you resist? then the patient would be really in the real situation, being fully activated, having the limbic system and the rest of the brain all activated. Of course, I can't do that because possession is illegal, offering the drug or selling drug is illegal, offering it to my patients is not ethical. You can see the nightmare. I put the goggles on and the virtual reality, and then what happens? I'm in this little place where people are selling drug, for example, and it would work. So there is systematic review, for example, for two years or from two years ago, that shows that you can elicit these cravings in people who have addiction just by showing them the virtual stimuli. It's the same thing. The brain, if you're a smoker, the brain sees the posters, the brain sees the smoke, the brain sees the coffee, and it's all conditioned and associated with the desire, the cravings to smoke or take weed or take cocaine or whatever, and we can do the psychotherapy in the safety of the office. Does it work? Well, rapidly, uh, there's a study that looks for smoking cessation. Have they shown that, yes, it does work? We're not at the stage where we have lots of data, as many sta the studies that we had in anxiety disorders, but it's coming, and we, have, we do have studies that show that if you use virtual reality, there are advantages. In terms of cost effectiveness, can we make the treatment more effective? This is a study we did uh, in Quebec on gambling addiction. And what we realized in gambling addiction, if I go straight to the point on that slide, is when you use virtual reality, you can, accept, you can access 
the misinterpretation of randomness. I think that gambler, addicted gambler, think they can beat the machine or they can beat the roulette. They can beat the machine. Uh, they can't, it's random. Uh, but they have this conviction. And the only way to access that was through virtual reality, where they got put the goggles on and do the treatment. And there's a study here on addiction as well. I just want to pace a little bit myself to accelerate. Um, can we make treatment more personalized, more complex? There's a study that was done in Belgium, uh, in Liège, where they look at smokers, I don't know, at drinkers. Uh, drinkers, heavy drinkers, occasional drinkers, heavy drinkers, if they go in this virtual bar where there are beers, there's posters, there's, there's soccer game going or football game, as they would say there. Um, and all these things, what do we do real realize is that heavy drinker are more cravings than occasional drinkers, and they do feel present. We have the same star, the same finding with anxiety disorder patient. The magic of virtual reality seems to play its effect through presence. People forget that they're not in a virtual environment. They feel present, and the emotional processing takes place as if people are in a real life situation. Other applications, virtual reality and uh, problems related to body image disturbance. <coughs> body image disturbance, it's a large um, topic that covers anorexia, that covers bulimia, that, co that includes binge eating, but it also includes obesity. Obesity is not, it is not an eating disorder. But obese, oftentimes obese people are dissatisfied with their body. They don't like what they look like. And there's other uh, options as well. And there's, there's a, there was a meta-analysis published, but there's two studies. So yes, I don't know exactly what to make out of it. Uh, two to three studies, depending on what you're looking at. But essentially, there's a few studies that shows that, yes, if you use virtual reality, you can challenge emotional discomfort to towards body image and use that in psychotherapy and make a treatment more effective. So in terms of randomized controlled trials, there's two studies with randomized controlled trials so far, uh, one in Spain, Ferrer Garcia, one in Italy, from Chesa and Giuseppe Riva, um, that shows that it works. We don't have tons, we don't have as many studies as we had for anxiety disorders. We don't even have half the number of studies we have for addiction, but results are pointing in the good direction that yes, it works. Can we make the treatment more effective? Probably, we don't know. Can it be used with other purposes with these populations? We don't know. Can we do things we can't? Yes, because in virtual reality, um, I'll look at that study, that, that image. In virtual reality, you, could, you, you, could, you, you can put your goggles on and you can look at different body sites. For example, I can ask people who are dissatisfied with their body, which body they would like to have. And there's a range from anorexia nervosa, from anorexia to obesity. And I could look at these bodies, but I could also walk around them. I can really get close and back. I can look at the knees. I could look at the portion of the body I don't like because I'm interacting with a virtual body that is actually breathing. But most fascinating is actually when I say, this is the body I want to look like or don't doesn't want to look like, in the goggles, then we can switch point of view. I could look down and I could see myself from what we call the ego perspective. Not ego in the sense of narcissistic, but ego in sense of yourself as your own point of view. So I can see my body that looks like what I want or don't want to look like. So we have much more potential for doing psychotherapy because now I feel like being in that body. Again, another area of work, schizophrenia. That's the last one we're going to cover today before I wrap up. But schizophrenia, that's the next line of research. Lots of people are doing research in schizophrenia. When I began doing studies and clinical trials on eating disorder, we, when I was doing training, we recommended that we don't put schizophrenic people in a virtual environment because, hey, they have challenges testing reality. Are you going to, and they think, I don't know, Napoleon is there or God is talking to them. Can we provide a third virtual reality that would make them worse? Uh, a study uh, in Spain, a study in England, and a study in Korea all showed that we're not making schizophrenic people or people suffering from schizophrenia 
more schizophrenic than they are before if we put them in a virtual environment. This is an example of one of the study where you're in the subway in uh, UK, I think it's London, uh, and we had they, this study asked uh, people suffering from parano paranoia what they think about these virtual character and paranoid patients were confident, they're totally sure that all of these characters were talking about themselves, about their the, the patient. Whereas these virtual characters are not talking about anyone. Um, so it was shown more than a decade ago that it is safe and now we are seeing studies across the world and this one is coming from uh, Netherlands where you have the, the people suffering from schizophrenia and that randomized control trial they would walk around a cafe, walk around a cafeteria, walk around different places and all these virtual characters would look at you or not look at you. They would chat. So for paranoia it's matter, it's, it's, con it's material we can use in psychotherapy. It's a matter of discussion with the therapist and the patient. Can you do it, do it uh, or not? What do you think about that? And it was interesting in the Potcolder study. Uh, the, the treatment that is in fashion now is called avatar therapy. Uh, the initial avatar therapy had no VR and the next one does, uh, but Say I'm afraid of bald guy. Say that my, I'm delusional, schizophrenic person, would confident that a bald guy with pointy ears and a red face is talking to me, and that's my delusion. Well, in virtual reality, we can recreate this virtual character, and I, as a psychotherapist, get out of a microphone, and through a microphone, I can talk, and this virtual character would talk back. So the patient would be actually talking with his delusion and then regain control of the delusional vision saying, look, you need to go away, I don't want to see you anymore. And I as, I, as a therapist, could be really helping or being more resistant if the patient is more able to sustain that. And they can actually talk with Napoleon or whatever they have they see to say to that person that has to leave. The, the, the Leff and Craig study initially were not that great, but now the study that was done in VR uh, was published by De La Zizzo, uh, it's kind of actually coming from Montreal, uh, and they showed that if you use the this kind of treatment, it is more effective than if you do standard treatment. So there's a clear advantages, uh, there are clear advantages of using technology. That's the only randomized control trial on that approach, so we're not to the point where we have tons of studies like anxiety disorders. But if I want to wrap up to leave time for discussion, I have to say that we know now that virtual reality is a well-documented tool to conduct exposure with people suffering from anxiety disorders. Being exposure is being facing what you're afraid of progressively and so on. So our four phobias, it's done. It's an old study. It's an old question. We know about that. For more complex anxiety disorder, well, it is undergoing. And data is accumulating to support the use of VR in the treatment of other mental disorders. We've seen uh, schizophrenia, but I could talk about phantom limb disorder. Uh, I can talk about autism. I can talk, talk about lots of other disorders where randomized control trials, trials are currently being done. Uh, there are many more applications. I said phantom limb, autism, dementia. We're working on a project with dementia. There's stuttering, for example. So it's a broad, very broad range of application that looks at mental health side of helping people to feel and, and be better. VR application must be developed based on a solid understanding on the dysfunctional mechanism. What's going wrong specific to each disorder? Uh, one thing I have emotional, well, one thing that drives me mad, if I can find it, I can't find anything more subtle than that. One thing that drives me mad is that I see more and more often now people saying, hey, we can use this technology for this and for that. But the real question is not what cool technology could we use? Because then we're actually either saying, any, saying that we're looking for gadgets or we're playing the game of tech companies. I think from at least a mental health professional point of view is what is it we can't do without the technology? And then let's look at the technology that is more used, more effective, would make more, would make it more effective or more or would be useful. So I, I think it is key that every field of application defines what is it that can't be done and then is VR a relevant tool? 
Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, it's fine. But I would approach it from the point of view of the needs and in terms of psychotherapy, what are the dysfunctional mechanism? What, what keep people stuck in some loop where it leads to mental disorders? Uh, and it is important to be aware of what is resting on solid empirical or empirical evidence and what is still at the research stage. Because it is, it is in fashion now. People claim that VR could is a cure for the common cold. Uh, but it is so cool and top that people say, yeah, 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 VR. But what are the evidences? Because there are really strong evidence, but not for everything, not in all contexts. And I'm just finishing on this, but look at the app. There, there's no mechanism to regulate the use and resell and publicity of mental health apps, apps on phones, either um, uh, Android or Apple. So it's a zoo there where everyone can sell their app at any cost for any kind of application, and it's not regulated. Health Canada is working on it. The uh, FDA in the US and every other uh, developed countries are, develop are working on that, but there's nothing for VR now. So someone can show up and say, look at this VR cool tool, but what are the evidence that it does work? Uh, we're coming to a close. Um, I have about four minutes for a, for a question and answer, and I'll be there after one o'clock. Uh, no problem, I have no appointments after one o'clock, but uh, if you need to contact me, you have my email address at the University of Quebec in Ottawa, uco.ca. Uh, and just to acknowledge that all the research I'm doing and I've been doing for 20 years cannot be done with without a large group. Uh, you can do VR research with really small budget and a few things and a few hardware and software, but if you really want to run 20 randomized control trials and 10 experimental studies at the same time, it needs to be done with a group. And this is a group of researchers, uh, technicians, uh, and the final support and the graduate students now working on VR in my lab. And so I want to make sure that in the end, I acknowledge their contribution and you are aware that you can contact me at that email address. And I'm going to stop sharing and be aware for question and answer. And I will let um, the organizer uh, decide how it goes for question and answer. Thank you very much.